Death, what is it? Where did it come from? Where does it go after it dies? <laughs> I, for one, am never gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about it and I was like, mm, not for me. <laughs> Just not in alignment with my goals and plans. And although actually real talk, God, when you like first lose faith in a religion and an afterlife, it mm. feels so scary to not to die. But now I'm like, can you imagine if you had to stare down the barrel of any kind of eternity? Oh no. You would never be able to be like, this too shall pass, because it's like it won't. Nope, it'll just be <laughs> more Existence and more itself this will be forever. endless. And yeah, people... what if you want to just like get out of the wheel? You can't. There's only like moral kingdoms. You can go to hell or you can go to different there's no way to just like cease existing if you're just not about it. Which mm. I feel like God should have an option for that. Yeah. Well and what is God doing? Just like creating more and more planets doing the exact same stuff. Like is there any one thing that you would do literally forever and not get bored? Smoke weed. Smoke weed. <laughs> Skateboard. <laughs> I remember being in like seminary and being like, is there rollerblading in heaven? Oh, it's like, of course there's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Watts brings in the point that like after a literal eternity, because even we can't even under like fathom what a million years would be like. That is I've absolutely beyond. I've been to the DMV without an appointment. So <laughs> it's actually fucked up that you would say that to me. But like after a true eternity, gazillions and gazillions and gazillions of years without being able to die, without oh, like. Yeah. Uh, he was like, eventually you get to the point where you would have been able to live every single fantasy you could possibly mm -hmm. imagine. You'd be an expert in every single field of awareness. You have lived every possibility. You've exercised power in every civil, single conceivable way. What then? And he's like, eventually, I think you'd get to the point where you would just be like, surprise me. Uh -huh. And at that point, God goes to sleep or takes a divine psychedelic drug and kind of throws into the chaos and just, and loses, the God loses itself in the experience of being alive. And that's sort of the Hindu concept of uh, reality that we're sort of, and also the Kanye West <laughs> <laughs> concept of reality. That this is a God dream. This is a God dream. Oh, this yeah. is it. He is God's vessel. He if is. anyone is, it's him. Well, he and Trump are gonna have to fight it out because Trump says, I am the chosen one. <laughs> Two dragons. Both alike in dignity. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mormon funerals. God is dead, we have killed him, we're all showing up. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about death in the world of Mormonism today because I feel like there is quite a lot of weird stuff and especially for our audience that have never been Mormon. This shit is whack. Yeah, you don't, uh, Mormon funerals are such Interesting is the wrong word. Interesting in the anthropological <laughs> sense, uh -huh. not so interesting in the experiential sense. <laughs> yeah. We should start by telling the story of Sister Holland because that's kind of what got us talking about this and wanting to do this video. So do you want to explain what happened recently after the wife of prominent LDS apostle Jeffrey R. Holland, Patricia Holland, died? Yeah, so if you don't know Jeffrey R. Holland, he recently made big waves in the Mormon discourse arena by pulling a metaphor, a gun metaphor, in reference to the queer community, saying that he wanted to hear more musket fire from the Temple of Learning, aka BYU, and the Church Educational Resources, saying that they wanted more musket fire directed at the queer community, people who are having issues with the church, which was, like, such an egregious thing to say, like, telling a community who's regularly the victims of gun violence, like that he wants to see more of that, just like extremely, extremely insensitive. The Mormon so, apologists will say that he was saying he wanted more musket fire aimed at, well, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to spin this. <laughs> He's not saying it should just be at gay people, but at practices and teachings. Gay marriage. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he is, he is <laughs> from a, a sane person's perspective, it's aimed at gay people either way, but from the myopic perspective of Jeffrey R. Holland and true believers, it's, it's not actually at them, because as long as they're being celibate and, uh, you know, not acting on their gayness in any way, <laughs> then they shouldn't have any musket fire aimed at them. So technically, uh, you're, you're spinning it. Yeah, well, uh, imagine the tables turned and someone were to say, we need more musket fire directed at the Mormons. How do you think they'd respond God, to that? You do they stuff that doesn't even involve them, and they're like, we're being shot at! Yeah. <laughs> like, can you imagine if there was like a... How dare thing? you say that? Don't you know in 20 years it's going to be illegal to read the Bible? It's like, oh my God, the persecution so. complex. <laughs> is crossed, that's so, a shit show. so, Patricia Holland. Patricia died. Holland recently passed away, um, tragically. I don't care who you are, if you're a bigot or otherwise. It's got to be so 
hard to lose a life partner. Like I really, How for did, all wait. our disagreements, I feel bad for Jeffrey R. Holland because that would just yeah. be absolutely she didn't, wrenching. She died of sort of normal age-related things, though, right? Yeah, it wasn't and like now it, he's okay. in the hospital. Yeah, um, that. sometimes that happens, you know. Totally. My, my mom's mom died a month after my mom's dad died because I just feel like when you've built a whole life with someone, I mean, yeah, it's got to be, it's yeah. got to be so tough. So certainly don't want to make <clears throat> make light of that. Like that that's just no. seeing a human being in that kind of pain is just really tragic. And that's a classic example of like we all bleed the same. Though I yeah. will say that like a lot of the time Mormon teachings and doctrine do kind of sort of minimize put pressure on people to minimize their grief and death because it's like you have oh, to be yeah. actually happy because they're in the afterlife now and you're going to see them again after you die so i do feel like there's ways that mormonism like robs people of the chance to grieve oh totally and we should definitely get into that but uh starting with patricia holland so uh a few photographs of her funeral surfaced and well even before the pictures of the funeral we get all the church news which uh, is putting out there, wife of Elder Holland dies. Like, they couldn't even say Patricia Holland. Like, didn't even give her a name or identity. She's only mentioned in relationship to him, which is kind of the whole Mormon schema, right? Like, we believe in heavenly parents. We're only allowed to talk about and interact with one. The other one don't even mention. She's there behind the scenes, pregnant and barefoot in the celestial kitchen. But she's doing a very important work that we're not allowed to talk about. To not and even mention her name, though, in her obituary is or an article about... I mean, unhinged. that just shows how <laughs> like ingrained the sexism is that it didn't even occur to them mm. that her first name might be relevant. Because she wasn't <laughs> born a Holland. She no. became a Holland by her. I feel like you should always put like a person's maiden name as well, oh, even, yeah. in their obituary. Because it's like... Before she was Patricia Holland, she was Patricia something else. And that part of her life is valid too. Totally. I mean, this that's just the Mormon way, right? Like, look at the scriptures. Um, apparently, men and women are supposed to be equal. But how many women's According names do you see in the Bible? Yeah. Like, yeah. No, women are told to be quiet in the Bible. The, the women of the Book of Mormon are complainers and whores and blah, 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 blah. What do you mean when you say men and women are supposed to be equal? That's what the church, that's what the church would say. Like, a member Were of the they? church would say, of course men and different women, but separate equal. but equal. Yeah. Like, we just have different divinely appointed roles. And so the men have all the power, authority, uh, are entitled to all their opinions. But you cannot and the women have to be quiet, submissive. And and depression. <laughs> that is something so sacred. Yeah. I hate when they use... Uh, uh, well, women get to have babies as the, the count. It's like, number one, not all women can have babies. Number two, for a lot of women, like pregnancy and childbirth is like a horrifying process and like, you know, not a sacred joy at all. And, mm-hmm. anyway. and funny how men are allowed to hold the priesthood, whether or not they're actually fathers, right. whereas women's only role mm-hmm. is seen as having and raising children, even though there's plenty of women who, like, biologically are incapable of having children. Mm-hmm. So the fact that, like, they put it out there like it's everybody's divine duty is already just stupid and fraught. But, yeah. um... And boring. Everyone isn't supposed to do the same thing. I know. Obviously, obvious point, but... <laughs> um, so, yeah, then the then the photos surfaced, and you see... I mean, let me pull it up right here. Let Tana just type in his 12-digit code to open his phone, (laughs) and then he'll be right with you. (laughs) I'm going to our... This is on our Instagram, by the way. We just hit 10,000 followers on our Instagram. Go follow us. This is off the shelf, underscore. So in in the picture, you see a big, like, auditorium of people, the stand, all the brethren behind... And then way off to the side, like, off to the- <laughs> is her casket. And, uh, you know, some people, somebody posted that and was like, this is just like, you know, it shows the sexism at play in the church. And then other people were like, well, how is it when the men <clears throat> die? What's their funerals like? And if you look at the pictures, I did, I went to, I looked up Robert D. Hales, who was one of the last uh, apostles to die, as well as Thomas S. Monson, and their caskets are front and center. And this isn't for nothing, you know? You can say, like, oh, it wasn't meant to be this way. It's like they it's needed an- to make space for them. <laughs> there just wasn't room in this particular venue for her casket to be up front. It's just like, like there wasn't room for her name in the article. I know. <laughs> there's room for 12 dudes. Feng Shui is maybe two... People might think it's, like, too woo to... But there is something to it. What you like, visually choose to make the focus yes. does matter. Especially As a graphic is, designer or, yeah. like, spatial designer, like... 
you know where focuses are, and that does have big implications, even if it's un- unintended. And the fact that she's just like cast off to the side while the men sit prominently mm. is just so sad. I also I don't know whether there was other like multimedia stuff going on that we can't see in that picture, but I've never seen a funeral where there's not like a big picture of the person who died. Like it just doesn't. <laughs> you just from you just have no. I mean, there's like a guy on the TV, but there's just like no. The piano got closer to the front than she did. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's just... Yeah. And then you've got a photo of uh, when a man died. So that's Monson's funeral. His coffin's front and centre, which is what you'd imagine. And also, you know that the church doesn't do things by accident. I'm sure it's actually protocol for them to have uh, a male... Yeah. Front, yeah. Like, there's... If, if they normally... If when Monson died, they had the casket front and centre, I would be very surprised if it wasn't a deliberate decision to not do that with Patricia Holland. Because mm. I just feel like if they have a way that they do something, they do it that way every time with, with procedures yeah. like that. And it makes sense to me that they would have a different procedure for a woman because, of course... All this is, <clears throat> is just a manifestation of this underlying relationship or modus operandi that the church has, which is uh, a... F- like full control over somebody's life. The Mormon church literally wants to own people. Like they'll come in between you and your own clothes. They have Mm. to have underwear that you have to wear at all times. Mm. Even in your own goddamn funeral, the church thinks that it owns that. Yeah. And we can dive right into that with, uh, here's a talk from, uh, Boyd K Packer where he talks about, you know, the, the proper procedures for funerals and he starts off with like a weird thing about Adam and Eve and how blood was like the life-giving substance that was put in their veins in Eden. And it's like, what do you mean the life-giving substance? Like food is a life-giving the substance. Single one. Air is yeah, I know. I'm like, you are no. plasma, other stuff. <laughs> I can't name them, but someone can. He says, except where burial is prohibited by law, we are counseled to bury our dead. This was actually so a, a shelf item for me, like yeah, as a teenager, because so I read, read in the handbook that they officially discouraged uh, yeah, cremation. Cremation, and I was like, "Why? Like, do you think there's going to be a difference between a body that died seventy thousand years ago and has disintegrated, and whose all that matter has been like recycled into other forms of life and other mm-hmm. beings? Do you think that that's going to be any harder to resurrect than a body that's been cremated? And Silly. Why is God pro formaldehyde in the ground? I just I- think. I can't imagine it. If he's omnipotent... Well, I can't imagine it with the Mormon God. He's not very eco-friendly, but I'm just like... Mormon God's uh, policies are always in line with, like, the outdated ideas. Oh, like, totally. everyone knows burial is bad now. <laughs> not Maybe not in not certain countries, but, yeah. but in America. I mean, burying people... Maybe cremation is, is just as bad. I'm not sure how they stack up. But I, I feel like growing up uh, in my family in England where no one was religious, everyone got cremated. I didn't know mm. anyone that would get buried. Mm. Well, yeah, as a teenager, I was like, I would rather be cremated and like scattered in mm-hmm. my favorite place. Maybe they than... don't like that idea though, because then you could get scattered. Then, mm. then that almost like encourages you to have places that are meaningful to you. Oh, totally. <laughs> outside of Mormon <laughs> venues. I don't know. Um, Connection with nature, a bit risky. He says that the purpose is because there's symbolism in burial. And it's like, symbolism in everything. Cares? <laughs> if you could, you could say there's symbolism in being cleansed by fire. Yes. Like multiple times. They talks love about a fire metaphor. Like, I know. Now you bulk at the fire metaphor. So dumb. I, this is legally binding. When I die, you bring this up. Do not let them give me a Mormon funeral or I will come back and haunt everybody who's watching this. We will be talking this. about that. If this is all new to you, we're going to dive into that. I want to be buried Either in like one of those like mushroom Obviously, suits, a tree pot is the dream. A tree pot, a tree pot with knows? like a flower bed around it. Yeah. I think that'd be sweet. If not, just cremate me and scatter me among the wildflowers. Somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Don't put me in the ocean though, because I don't want my energy cycle back into a deep ocean fish form. I'd rather <laughs> yeah, go like one of those mammal bird fish. tree. Yeah, yeah, I don't want that. <laughs> don't trust the ocean. I don't connect with it in the same way. Yeah. I mean, I love the ocean. Fertilize a wildflower meadow, yeah. not the sharks. Yeah. So yeah, Mormon funerals are notorious, especially among ex-Mormons who kind of, you know, once the the veil has been lifted, so to speak, once your blinders aren't on anymore and you attend a funeral after leaving Mormonism, you quickly realize that Mormon funerals (laughs) don't really talk about the person who died that much. They'll only talk about them insofar as it relates to Mormonism and like the church's teachings that they're constantly trying to entrench people in further. You don't get the same kind of like celebration of life that you that I am used to. I've been to so many funerals because I'm just from an aging family, mm-hmm. and I've, I've probably been to like ten 
old people funerals in my family in England. And they're all just like such celebrations of who that person actually was. Mm -hmm. But I feel like Mormon funerals are sanitized. No aspects of their personality really seem to be to come up unless they connect to the church. I'm sure this is all like uh, obviously like family dependent and circumstantial, but it is, you know, there's a reason ex-Mormons have in mass noticed that Mormon funerals aren't really about the person who died as much as regular funerals. I, I could imagine a lot of like believers watching this and being like, that's not true. At yeah. my mom's funeral, there was they a whole thing on her life. And there was, yeah. I gave her memory yeah. of life things and we all talked about her, but it's less common. It is a trend. Yeah. And, and it's backed up and by, it is literally by choice. So like, even if that is the case, we're like, Oh yeah, they talked about the deceased. Of course they're going to talk about the deceased, but the idea if the official stance of the church is that funerals are not for that, that they are for preaching the gospel. Prove Here it. is, here's Boyd K. Packer. Many attend apostle, funerals. Former apostle Boyd K. Packer, who is dead and whose casket was no doubt front and center at his funeral. <laughs> I watched this funeral. I bet you did. Uh, many attend funerals who do not come to church regularly. They come subdued in spirit and are teachable. Ah. <laughs> subdued, that's an interesting word. <laughs> subdued, no, defense is down. <laughs> Vulnerable. Vulnerable. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's completely in line with how... Vulnerable they, is even a better word than subdued, because yeah. subdued has that but idea But he knows like. you can't... Yeah. <laughs> it's classic Mormon missionary. That's the missionary strategy, is find vulnerable people. So, of course, they're doing this at funerals. How sad when an opportunity for conversion is lost because a funeral just is because, less than it might have been. How you sad were here. <laughs> just because someone has died and their family wants to celebrate them instead of being missionaries in this moment. Devastating. Wow. Instead Tragic. of talking about your loved one who died, you could have been preaching to someone. You could have used it as an as an opportunity to do some free marketing labor for a multi-billion dollar corporation. Did you ever think about that? How sad you are. I also just think it's stupid because I think you're more likely to convert people by focusing on all the beautiful aspects of the person who, you know, if there's like a non-member there who's coming to mourn the loss of a loved one, I feel like focusing on all the things that everyone loves about that loved one is probably more likely to create a positive impression of the church and Uh, that environment than the, like it doesn't, a lot of Mormonism strategies like just simply don't hold up anymore and don't work and they just make everyone think that people are really weird. Like maybe it worked in the 50s when people were a little bit more primed for like, new Christian religions, but mm. I don't know. Like, this doesn't work. This doesn't make people want to become Mormon. It just makes them think, like, damn, this loved one was in a cult. <laughs> I mean, and then they bury you in your temple <clears throat> clothes, right? Like, that's a thing. Oh, my God. If they try to bury me in temple clothes. God. Ugh. You know, he if says, they do, it's just part of the ongoing bit that is your your story. Cruel poetic irony. I'll do my best, though. <laughs> I'm giving but, you legal right of attorney after Jim this episode. Jim is a tough episode. man. I don't know if I can go head to head with him. There is a reason to fear that we are drifting from the sacred spirit of reverence, which should characterize funerals. The brethren have discussed this in council meetings and are concerned. They're sitting in council meetings being like, like people, people are, are having too much fun with funerals, unhinged. focusing too much on the dead, unhinged. forgetting who's really in charge here. I mean, he's really already said why that the only reason they care is because they're like, oh, this is like the one of the only times some people will come to a Mormon church. Mm-hmm. Because everyone's going to go to a funeral. Even yeah. a wedding, it's like, well, they can't come to your wedding, so they might not, you know, <laughs> they might go to your reception, but that's not really I'm like surprised the Mormons thing. haven't tried to exclude people from funerals. <laughs> They're doing it for weddings for no goddamn reason. There's not a scripture that says you're not allowed to witness marriages. Like, you're not get performing an ordinance. It's literally out of spite and tradition that they're like, you're not allowed because you're impure. Or only pure people can see our weddings. Do, do you think it has anything to do with polygamy? I feel like everything lately is like connecting to polygamy in my brain. But oh, I'm that's like, actually, that's actually a a good theory because you wouldn't be, want someone in the out group knowing right. about another plural marriage it all i mean that may to people who are unfamiliar with the history may seem kind of speculative but you're totally yeah. right <laughs> that in, the, in the early uh you know mid 1800s <clears throat> to early 1900s so many of the practices and teachings of the church now were formed by polygamy and mm. the culture of secrecy that had to be uh perpetuated around it because they were of course breaking the law. So Boyd K. Packer basically openly said, you need to be more about Mormonism in your funerals. I can't imagine the limit ever being reached of like how much it is okay to focus on the person who died at a funeral. <laughs> I know, I it's just, like their one thing, that's right? That's one the thing, The one time yeah. when you should be allowed. I'm surprised it's not like, birthday parties are an opportunity <laughs> to preach the gospel. Yeah. He says, oh, he's quoting from the priesthood bulletin. Oh shit. So if that's not authoritative <laughs> for you, I don't know what is. 
It is requested that henceforth all funerals conducted, conducted under the auspices of the officials of the church follow the general format of the sacrament meeting with respect to music, speaking, and prayers. You know how they're like, the gospel is so simple. Even a child can understand it. And then they've got like all these other rules and procedures and meetings and ordinances mm-hmm. that have nothing to do with those basic principles that they talk about. I call bullshit. It should be like sacrament meeting. Music should be used at the beginning of the service prior to the opening prayer and possibly after the invocation also is in our Sunday meetings. And I'm guessing it's only hymns. Of course. Do you, Does anyone ever have like a, a secular song at a Mormon funeral? Is that explicitly banned or? If uh, it, it would have to be like in maintaining the spirit of reverence, like at my grandma's funeral, they sang, did I fill the world with love my whole life through, which is so like a, a choral song. piece that's not Mormon. But they're but doing it on the piano in Mormon. And a choir they singing it. They wouldn't just like <laughs> play Jamie Callum's Everlasting Love over the speakers. No, you can't get up there and play uh, Let It Be or... You should be to play any song you want at your funeral. I know, right? Uh, with respect to speaking, it should be kept in mind that funeral service provide an excellent opportunity for pe- teaching the basic doctrines in a positive manner, as opposed to all the other occasions where we teach it in a very unpositive manner. Also, basically <laughs> telling people, like, keep it light, keep it positive. It's like you're grieving the loss of your life. You just shouldn't, th- oh, you shouldn't feel any responsibility to do that in that moment. There are limits to what may be done without disturbing the spirituality and causing it to be less than it might be. We should remember, too, that others attending the funeral may suppose that innovation, switching up the program, is an accepted procedure and introduce it at other funerals. Thus, unless we are careful, an innovation which was allowed as an accommodation to one family in one funeral may come to be regarded as expected in every funeral. Oh my God. If we make a funeral uh, personal to one person who died, <laughs> then we're going to start having to make it personal to everybody who dies. And is that so what you want? Slow. A personal funeral? And then people I don't are think be so. You want another sacrament meeting. Dogs. <laughs> Insane. It's like Whitney Houston will spread like a virus if we allow her into the sacred walls of the sanitary chapel with the carpet walls. Oh my God. Bishops should remember that when funerals are held under priesthood auspices, the the service should conform to the instructions given by the church. We should regard the bishop rather than the family or the mortician as the presiding authority (laughs) in these matters. The, The church owns you even when you're dead. Well, if you hated your bishop. (laughs) <laughs> you know, you, some oh people just God. don't get along. My grandma's, at my grandma's funeral, the stake president, who I don't know ever met her in his whole life, did like spoke for most of the time mm. or for a significant part of the time, kept mispronouncing her name, kept saying the wrong name. He kept calling her uh, JoLynn or something. Her name's Jolene. Yes. And it was just like, this is so dumb. Yeah. I hate this. You've never met her. You're just using this as an opportunity to like say your bit and show how spiritual you are. You don't care about her. This is my <clears> fucking <throat> grandma. Also, this idea that um, certain things will will make it so that it's no longer spiritual. Um, It's just, once again, what a narrow view of God and spirituality Ah, to be like, actually... Uh, less thing. There are less things than you think that can still be spiritual. Instead of expanding your view of what's spiritual, because everything's spiritual, such as in Zen. Yes, yes. Annoying. There is no separation from the mundane and the sacred. Like, yeah. It's all existing together. You cannot tell me that Celine Dion's <laughs> music is not spiritual. You cannot tell me that my choreographed dance to (laughs) to my heart will go on. (laughs) Sometimes family members tell things that would be appropriate at a family reunion or at some other family gathering, but not on occasion that should be sacred and solemn. Like what? What's someone going to say at a funeral? Just telling like a funny story. Mormons already have a ban on loud laughter. They literally Mm -hmm. covenant in the temple to not laugh loudly. So, we don't want anyone having too good of a time in any way. While quiet humor is not out of order in a funeral, it should be wisely introduced. Let me wisely introduce some quiet humor. You can exhale through your nose a little bit, but the minute it's becoming like an audible chuckle... Too much. God is offended. (laughs) There's no spirituality in laughter. It's it's just so uh, encouraging people to like repress a lot of the things that naturally kind of soothe us in our grief. Like laughter, is, in my experience, has actually been quite a, a big part of funerals and wakes. Famously a great medicine, the best yeah, medicine. <laughs> because th- there is something, laughter often comes out of like juxtaposition from like the seriousness of the fact that someone's died. But then also you can just like share in the most absurd stories about that person together and it 
that is like what helps people grieve and and sh- and share the emotional burden together and and the fact that they're just kind of like clamping down on all of that and making it all about them yeah most of the mormon funerals i have been to in my life were when i was a believing mormon this wasn't me just being like i'm an angry bitter apostate with an axe to grind i'm going to show up to my grandma's funeral with anger in my heart like you know you want to be respectful and enjoy the experience but even as a mormon i was like this doesn't yeah. feel personal I like walked away being like, this was like a cartoon version of this person and it's not real. And like what you were talking about in the beginning of like not being able to properly grieve because the idea is that the funeral exists to preach the gospel, that showing you're sad in a way, like if you were to like be crying too much, if you were to like yell, which you would never do in any Mormon service, you would never like groan in grief and pain because it's seen as like, you don't really believe yeah. that they're still living. Yeah. You don't really believe with their God if you're mourning. There's a social credibility, there's social points to be gained in being so stoic or even erring on the side of the like toxic positive because that means you have a really strong testimony. You're not even sad. I mean, wouldn't you say that would be kind of the ultimate faith in Mormonism to barely even be sad yes. because you are so confident you'll see them again? Oh, yeah. It doesn't bother me. I know exactly where they are. They're up in heaven. They're in the spirit world. I know that. I don't even got to cry. It's Not like, me. I'm tough. So if the love of my life moved to another country for 20 years, even if I knew where they were, I'd still be really sad. Oh, totally. Like you still have to get through the rest of this life without them. Mm-hmm. Um, you were talking about the, uh, some of the funerals you've been to. They're almost like a cartoon version of, of that person. Yeah, I'm like, this didn't create a real, like, yeah. I know that person. And they had a lot of issues that are just like... None of that mm. happened. Everything was just, they were just the perfect disciple of Christ and they cared about God more than anything in the world. <laughs> and now they're up in heaven with him. I know it. Wow. It's like, I feel like especially uh, with women, they do that. Like they just flatten her down to like, she ne- it's always, she's submissive she and never, served, complained. never complained. She was so she nice sacrificed to so much. Constant sac- <laughs> yeah. And then with the man, it's always like, these are all the callings he, he had. To his yeah. callings but it's like, it, it's, it's dehumanizing to not be like allowed to or, like for it to be uh, kind of like a social faux pas to just allow for the complexity of who that human was. Like I feel like at the funerals I've been to, there would be little jokes about like the person's shadow side and like they could sure, you know, they were the one likely to knock over a drink at Christmas dinner. But then there's kind of like a shared uh, humor in that, you know, because mm. it's like we all did know this person for who they like. There's no... I don't think it's good at a funeral to just like squash someone down to only their positives. I think it's just to be able to talk about all of it without shame and just with an appreciation for like the totality of who they were. Mm-hmm. Which, and of course you're naturally in grief, going to want to think yeah, about the good yeah. things and talk about the positive. It's not like we need course, to bring up wanna, all the issues. Yeah, you're like, I'm going to not stand up and yeah. like deliver a roast. Though if my friends didn't do that for me at my funeral, I would be offended. <clears throat> but it's, yeah, it's like if you, <laughs> yeah, we will definitely roast you. If your granddad who died had a foul mouth, and, you know, you're a Mormon. That's a funny thing to bring up at a funeral. The mm. fact that, like, he was, like, this faithful bishop, but at home he would, like, always swear every time he, like, <laughs> drops it. Like, that... I feel like even things like that would be seen as... That uh, is not playing into the sacred character of funerals, which yeah. are opportunities for preaching the gospel, not talking about grandpa's cursing habits. And I feel like all this is uh, illustrative of, like, the same phenomenon we see in life with Mormons which is like it's just more about what you present externally and and keeping so many parts for yourself hidden like how many Mormon families have been dysfunctional because there's this pressure to like be this perfect certain type of family outwardly but like that just isn't in line with our humanity and like how we all are as complex individuals who don't like neatly fit into all these boxes and act in these perfect ways all the time like we're all messy and contradictory and I feel like in life and in death, Mormonism does that to people, like just like re- reduces them. And it's like they still are all those other things. You're just like relegating it to the dark. And, and as and that's both as a like a person who lives and then dies the deceased and the people around them that they're mm-hmm. not able to properly uh-huh. uh, identify or articulate their own grief. And because yeah. the, the conversation is always geared toward the gospel it uh, disallows people from just expressing the things that have nothing to do with the mm-hmm. church and just with their relationship. It feels like, especially when there's some kind of complicated death in Mormonism, like suicide, that especially, like people don't know what to do with that. Because mm-hmm. again, like the whole like way that Mormons grieve death and do funerals 
is just through this one specific lens. And if someone is like really far outside of that, uh, this kind of brings us into the next thing I wanted to talk about. So actually I'll just use this as a segue. People uh, who in life did not want to be Mormon were not part of Mormonism, like had left it in spirit or like resigned. And then their families insisting that they still have a Mormon funeral and then still their families in <laughs> death seeing this person through the lens of Mormonism, something that like they did not identify with at all. Chilling. Very <laughs> We've, chilling. I mean, even so far as to, you know, family members burying people in their temple clothes who wanted nothing to do with Mormonism and had even explicitly said they didn't want that. I've seen so many stories and, oh, yeah. of people saying like, Ex-Mormon my brother that, specifically yeah. said he didn't want this and my parents are doing it anyway. Or um, rebaptizing people after death who again wanted oh. nothing to do with Mormonism. And it's like, sure, they're dead, whatever, but it just like kind of shows, yeah, it shows like, the, like, you want to talk about respect for the dead. I'm like, but then I get it because they, they, they genuinely believe it. Like the, in their minds, they're doing a good thing. So thoroughly has Mormonism co-opted everything for them. Like the irony of dead, the phrase <clears throat> dead works seems so potent with Mormonism. Like yeah. the best thing they can imagine doing for the world is like spend diddling away their time doing dead works for dead people. It's like the least effective thing you could do for the real world. It's like, ooh, you go to your nice multi-billion dollar castle to pretend to get baptized, like mm-hmm. to get baptized for dead people. Which is, this is a good segue to talking about that not only do Mormons baptize their dead ones, they also baptize... Adolf Hitler several <laughs> times. <laughs> it's and at the, this point common t- knowledge that the church uh, got in trouble for baptizing Holocaust victims. Oh, just God, going yeah. through the records and being like, we got to save all the Holocaust victims. <gasps> and th- not only did they baptize the Holocaust victims and they got in trouble and eventually were like, okay, we got to stop that. But they also, like you said, baptized Hitler and his wife. Didn't the church have to put out a statement being like, stop baptizing Hitler? I swear something like that. They did it multiple times. It was like... And like he's had his chance. He's either <laughs> said yes or no. Just move on. There was like multiple people that was like, we got to give Hitler the chance to get to heaven so that he can be there with all the 6 million people he killed. We've got to make that possible. Something that I just think is interesting. Sorry if this is a bit of a backtrack, but just talking about like the plan of salvation the whole time at Mormon funerals, you would think given that like this life, we only get one earth life, right? Mm. And then it's like celestial glory, blah, 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 forever. So you would think funerals would be a good time to talk about all the like earth life related things <laughs> to the person, like the things they loved on earth, like who they were as an earthly person. Cause it's like, if this really is like how things are for eternity, then that's going to be going on for eternity. That's like the name of the game, no matter uh, what. So who gives a shit? Yeah. Like, let's talk about who this person was on earth. I don't know. I mean, there's so much that doesn't make sense when you just think about like the plan of salvation and how, like, what, how many members of the church are there, like, on record, like, 16 million active? It's like, what, like, 8 million or something? Compared to the rest of the population of the world, it's like, what, like, 0.02%? So you're telling me that God in his infinite wisdom and his plan for his, you know, some however many billions of children is for that, that most of them are just going to live a life that has nothing to do with the Church of Jesus Christ of mm-hmm. Hints. The vast majority, like 99.9% of people on this earth who go through life and death uh-huh. are never going to hear about the church. But 0.02% of them are going to spend years of their life doing works in the dead or, you know, baptize for the dead afterward. So it's like, what is the fucking point of this life yeah. if, ever, if the vast majority of people don't even have that plan. Like, what kind of plan is that? Yeah. It's really dumb. <laughs> it's like every every high control religion and cult has to have some kind of story for why they're special and also has some, has to have some kind of explanation for why this thing that is apparently, like, the reason we're all here is only known by a small group of people. But I feel like Mormonism especially shoots itself in the foot because they've had this narrative of, like, the gospel will spread to the whole earth. And it's like, well, it's not. It's actually, like, there's less people all the time. But Jeffrey R. Holland just said that the stakes are growing at an alarming the rate. It's the biggest problem not. they have. That is such a fucking lie. <laughs> Someone That's crunched the numbers absurd. from the exact time period he said, and they had, Ridiculous. like, closed a bunch of stakes and yeah. other things. It's, it's like, giving d- Kendall fudge the numbers on living plus totally i wanted to talk about um because we've talked about mormon funerals very drab very church oriented by design like you um, said there's always examples of people who 
didn't have that experience but it's like well you're, you're you are not in line with what the apostles are teaching is important you are apparently the reason they're having to get together and talk about how funerals are <laughs> not going well <laughs> we need to control this everything needs to be exactly the same all the time and controlled by the men mm. or else because um, heaven forbid people have any outlet for grief other than mormonism because that's kind of the, their main thing yeah shame and grief and heaven forbid they grieve truly grieve at all because grief like i agree i have you. i have cried at Mormon funerals, but I haven't truly grieved. Mm-hmm. And there is a big difference. And I now being on the outside and have experienced collective grief. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I think I've talked about before on the channel about a grief ritual that I participated in where, you know, this is a big group of people and everyone takes a minute or two to, I mean, it was more than that, but to, in like little breakout groups, express something that they were wrestling with, something mm-hmm. that was weighing heavy on them, something that they were grieving. And then afterward, I'm just trying to paint a picture of what's going on. This is taking place in like a forest canyon. It's just like a beautiful mm. place, very private, nobody around watching. I did so a, like a, a very virtual s- grief one during COVID, which oh, is also beautiful. nice. beautiful. Yeah. And then there was uh, like a very simple musical arrangement, like literally just this old guy on a drum singing a, like a repetitive but like calming thing and other people singing too. And I heard this from down the canyon. I wasn't originally participating. I heard it singing... And then as people, as he's singing and playing, there's this uh, place in the front of the group and there was some kind of symbolic thing, a glass of, you know, a vase of water or something where people were kind of encouraged to like lay it out. And people were coming in droves and just grieving, Mm -hmm. which was something I had never seen before, Mm -hmm. like really grieving. And you could tell that what people were grieving was like, for some people, very harrowing. It was bringing up anger and they had like these big padded sticks that people were banging on mats, you know? And you could see that pain that was allowed to be expressed for the first time. Mm -hmm. Because we're all, you know, in Western modern culture, we are taught to just bottle things up, push things down, deal with grief on your own. When in fact, for the vast majority, we are, we are communal animals. We're fucking primates. And sharing that grief has been a part of our, our biological and social experience for hundreds of thousands of years. Mm-hmm. And now, you know, since the Victorian era or whenever, we've been conditioned to believe with these isolated beings that have to, you know, not show any animal displays of emotion or whatever. Like you're a different yeah. thing. And, and we um, have to like shove down, like, you know, the beating with sticks thing would seem so like out there for oh, a Western totally. society, but it's like our, our nervous systems and our bodies evolved to like get release yes. through these certain things that we stifle in our society. I feel like a lot of my coaching sessions end up being grief work to one degree or another because a people in Mormonism are not allowed to just hold like the complexity of the experience and the contradictory aspects of it all. You know, you can like lose someone who you love dearly, who also hurt you a lot and their death can like bring up the ways they hurt you. And you know, Mm -hmm. it's not just like this black and white thing, but also Mormonism like demands that you like immediately ascribe this, you know, it's not logical to us, but in their minds, like logic and reasons and like narratives to it that just like aren't always natural and obviously like aren't true from our perspective. So it's like, you're immediately having to allow Mormonism to co-opt your grief. It's like someone's Mm -hmm. died and Mormonism like takes that and is like, yep, yep, we'll show you how to, and then, Uh, but then you get such limited release. The church once again is like controlling your access to your own humanity. It's dictating what like aspects of humanity you're allowed to like display or it's just so fucked up. Yeah. I love that phrase that our friend Kelly says that uh, any feeling you bury is buried alive. 100%. And that quote from the prophet that's like, uh, the deeper that sorrow carves into your being, the more joy your cup can contain or whatever. Yeah. It's so true. The prophet Khalil Gibran, Gibran, yeah. not a, <laughs> the yeah, Mormon yeah. prophet. By the way. You can never. <laughs> it just is so true that if you uh, sort of cut off or repress your experience of life at one end of the spectrum, it does it at the other end of the spectrum, which is advantageous for high control groups like Mormonism because then they can keep you in that middle where you're more easily controlled. Because when we're experiencing more intense emotions, like more intense experiences are expansive. Like Mm -hmm. someone, my grandma dying when I was 22, 23, just like changed everything for me. Like I just left Mormonism and her dying was like the catalyst for me, like thinking about so many things. And I feel like it's that way for a lot of people. It really Mm -hmm. forces you to reckon with life in different ways. Like people dying is a big way that we all mature and like come, because there are so many ways that like we 
kind of deny reality in our everyday life. Like we don't want to think about death. And then when death comes, you're like, oh, th this is like a massive part of, of the human experience that like mm. I have to reckon with. I have to reckon with the fact that my life is going to end. And that can really shift how you look at things and blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah, blah. Yeah. And it is hard when you've only experienced that, like, you know, approaching that uh, grief grief experience, that communal grief experience was new to me. Like I said, I didn't start out participating. I was further down the canyon, even though I was part of the wider event, it was a singing fest festival, not the right word, yeah. but anyway. Um, but I was just like compelled to go witness it because I could hear people crying, I could hear people singing, and I was like, my heart like is yearning mm. to go see that, to go, exp I've never seen anything like that. And so I did, I went over there and just seeing people like weeping and like ugly crying snot and saliva down the face to see people like banging out their <clears throat> anger and holding each other in their grief. Like I'm gonna get emotional just talking about it because like it felt like the most human experience that I'd ever experienced and yet it was so new to me. Mm. And, and yet also probably natural seeming. Totally, totally. Like familiar and unfamiliar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because like like I said, we're conditioned to bottle, bottle up, push down and individualize our suffering. But so much of what we as communal um, tribal beings are experiencing, our grief is mm. collective. Our pain is collective. I'm not suffering because of things that nobody else in this world can understand. Mostly I'm suffering with things that a lot of people can understand, um, just like you know, grappling with climate change and the problems of capitalism and all the suffering and pain of the world. Like we can all relate to that. And, and yet, because of hyper individualism, capitalist society, we're again, we're kind of like corralled into holding this ourselves and being able to experience and express and hold it. Mm -hmm. Initially, I was scared I didn't want to participate because I didn't want to be seen in my grief. I was, right. It was too vulnerable and I didn't want to hold it for other people. I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't really know you. I don't, I can't make that space for you. I'm like, I have enough going on in my own head mm -hmm. to then like, I don't want to like sit down with a stranger and hear about them being abused or a family member that died. It's just like, it's too much for me. I just, I need to just like worry about myself and sing my happy little songs. But the experience of being able to grieve together was absolutely change life changing because what I experienced in that was not being overwhelmed with other people's grief. Mm -hmm. It like washed my heart. It made my burden light and holding it all together made it very easy. And it became this like renewing enriching experience. I fell down on my hands and knees and just wept. And I held people as we cried together and sang together. And it was like the most beautiful life affirming experience just to be able to grieve together. It's crazy that that's a, like a radical yeah. or like woo woo concept. Fucking capitalism. It's so yeah. advantageous for the system of capitalism and the people at the top of it. If we are all suppressing our grief and, and don't join because we're so powerful when we come together in our grief and so many of so much of our consumption is driven by like wanting to run from from that, you know, just like mm. the belief that if I have more, then like my pain will somehow be less when mm. we, we know that's not true. What's interesting too, is after the grief had run, and this was like hours of grief, grieving. And eventually it got to the point where like everyone stopped grieving and was just like standing, holding each other and like singing together. Mm. And it became, and I'm, I'm aware that like these states of mind and being and experience are like people are in a very vulnerable state and we need to have like really important conversations about how to Not like exploiting people. In that exactly. State, yeah. Exactly. And people who are coming out of <clears throat> exploitative religious systems, uh, that could be, you know, like yeah. red flags. Like I don't want to be yeah. vulnerable in that way. And I, I totally get that. And we do need to have conversations about how to approach those kinds of things. But, um, for me, it was all very pure and, um, and then ended up being this like extremely ecstatic mm -hmm. experience where in it on the, on the one hand, I was like, I've never grieved like this with people and experienced this pure, rich human cleansing experience. 
And then on the, and then once that all all the rot was scraped away and that pain just witnessed, mm-hmm. I think that was it. It was just like witnessing each other being like, holy it's shit, so we all partake of the sacrament of suffering. Every single one of us are like have this part in us that is like racked with pain. And even though we're not living in it all the time, there are things that are just like so painful that everyone experiences because we all have people who die. We all have people who leave us. We all have like pain and sickness. Like it's happening to everybody and just be able to like just witness it with each other instead of like walking around, well, I'm good, I'm good but just to be like connect on that real level so good and then like I said in response this like ecstasy and this like communal joy in a way that I had never experienced before and I don't you know there's like specific things I could talk about that was like whoa that was so cool I've never experienced anything like just these like you're kind of like synced up mentally and emotionally with people mm. in like a in a really beautiful way right yeah, not like that's how we're wired like our nervous systems co-regulate we are we are like hardwired yeah to find joy to be bodily excited and pleasured at the at somebody else being mm-hmm. having joy yeah we are we are like communal beings you know when you are going through something and it feels and grief too it feels so dark and like confusing and then even just telling a friend about it and just having them hear you, it like, it lightens it and it makes it feel not so dire. Mm -hmm. Like even just, you know, in the day-to-day smaller things and everyone doesn't even have access to this kind of like community of just being able to tell friends about what you're going through in a really authentic way, knowing this is an issue in Mormonism is you know that people are always going to be like checking you to make sure that like nothing you're feeling is like too unfaithful or, you know, it, it doesn't allow space. People just need spaces of deep listening where there's like just full compassion for what they're experiencing and there's no need to be problem solving or assigning narratives. And again, that's what so many of my coaching sessions end up being, even with people that uh, will come to me, I don't know, wanting to talk about goals for their career or, or wanting to like set better boundaries with family. I feel like so much of what all of us are going through all the time kind of relate often relates back to like grief that we haven't grieved yet. You know what I mean? Like we, we, if we contain within us, like just a well of ungrieved emotions, that's going to come into every area of our life. And we need to have some space we can go to with others, I think. Um, and I think what you're just like a community would be the ideal, but under but capitalism, not always, yeah. if you don't have access to that's that, that's not the only way, certainly <laughs> book a session with me. <laughs> like that's something we should ideally all have, but mm. because of capitalism, we don't. And then now we have to have come up with solutions under capitalism, such yeah. as co- anyway, it, it sucks, but it is what it is. But and yeah, like the, the release, it's crazy to me. The release people get just by simply like getting it all out and like feeling okay to cry and not like it's it's really wild how much people can solve their own problems after they like do that and also how like simple it can be Mm -hmm. but it's like simple but also because our our families and our culture our society has not taught us to do it we all kind of like need to learn how to do it and it you know it it's like something that's been taken from us in our socialization that we now need to like learn how to get back yes but then it's so natural when we do get it back and it's so powerful and it's like almost feels like too good to be true how big of an impact it can be to just yeah vent or grieve yep one of my favorite words in the english language is integral Mm. and i i like subscribe to integral philosophy and in this matter we talked about like you know bottling your emotions or suppressing it this like Victorian idea that you just need to like cut off all your animal nature and try to be this other thing when I think the real like and I think that that um, relegation of the animal into the shadow realm is largely responsible for so much of the societal dysfunctions that Mm -hmm. have happened in the world people's um, unconscious desires Uh, playing out in dysfunctional ways because they're not allowed to properly integrate those desires. So I think it's not about suppressing or overcoming the natural man or, you know, anything like that. It's about integrating. Like you Mm -hmm. have animal instincts and desires and needs and how do you integrate them healthily so it's not unhealthily popping up outside. And in terms of grief, like 
giving your grief a place to go, whether it's just like sharing it with another person. So it's not just living in your body, poisoning you from the inside out. Like Mm -hmm. we have to be able to do that with a friend, with a coach, with a community. It's something we have to do. You have to give feeling somewhere to go that's not in your body. It's another reason why art is such an effective means of processing. Mm -hmm. It's like literally creating something so that the, the feeling can live in that rather than just living in your body and uh, talking, talking with someone. Yeah, I'm just repeating myself at this point. But You're so good at that. You've made so much art that is, seems like it's been a big part of your grief journey. I'm specifically thinking high, of High on a Mountaintop, which a lot of people mm. will have seen. But you've, I feel like you do that in painting, in music, in rap. In what are some other ways? I don't know. I just think you're really good at that. My mental health raps. <laughs> My little mental health raps. Okay, I love when we do videos like this where we we start off talking about like here's what Mormonism is getting wrong, but then we f- we like then take it to a place of, but here's what it could be like because mm. I I think so often people just see us as just wanting to shit on the church and blah blah blah, but it's like. But the reason we're interested in doing that is because like there are better ways and we're not prescribing like one specific way of doing anything, but there are just things that are fundamental truths. Like the fact that we are community beings and we are wired to co-regulate with each other's nervous systems and we do need to hold each other in our grief. And those basic facts, uh, you know, are kind of like true no matter what, whichever like style or flavor of grief work you take. There's a lot of, a lot of methodologies, a lot of practices and it's all, it's different for everybody. Yeah. But I, but I think the, the non-negotiables are like community, like shame, not being present, allowing for complexity and paradox. I think there needs there's it's usually helpful to have like a bodily element of release like that uh, yeah. virtual covid ceremony i did i'm sure it's like this with all of them at the end they uh played drums and everyone was encouraged to like dance it out and it sounds so silly but i've done that like when i'm feeling intense feelings i'll just like put a song on that kind of reminds me you know is like on theme and like dance as if my movements are like expressing my feelings and it's really weird like how much you do get it out through doing that. Like That's when I was talking about the ecstasy after the grief, yeah. it was, it was people dancing together Yeah, and the like group cohesion of that dance, like without talking about it, mm. like everyone was like dancing together and then like moving in sync. It was just beautiful. Mm. Just beautiful. I totally believe it. I like the word you used earlier about when you were talking about the grief ceremony of how it was a really rich experience. Cause I think again, we're so used to, like categorizing things as good or bad and like how many of us grew up when we cried adults would be like don't cry totally another example of how like how the ways we evolve to process feelings are shut down by the idea that the displaying of feelings is somehow bad Mm. um but yeah it's i feel like thankfully mormonism in my experience is a little is more open to that like crying um, yeah it's almost right, yeah like men are, are given the space to be emotional granted only for that one particular thing and as like yeah. a virtue symbol and but certainly I not have to if you're one of so brigham bad. young's polygamous wives oh, absolutely not. <laughs> anyway i was just talking about how i like the word rich that you use because i feel like once you uh become more familiar with grief and, and allow yourself to have those experiences more you realize that like this actually isn't something bad like i've subconsciously ran from it in all these ways like i've been conditioned to my whole life but it's actually, it's sort of that um, peace that passeth all understanding or like, just like that, that beauty and that joy that can exist with pain. Like mm-hmm. things are not always one or the other. And grief is such a good example of that. It's like this, like, because a lot of the time when you're grieving, you're feeling like a deep love and appreciation for someone. And like, there's so much beauty in all of that. And then you're, you know, you're mm-hmm. feeling both at the same time. Yes. And uh, I don't know, Mormonism loves to categorize things into God or Satan, good or bad. Everything yes. is one or the other. Yes. I love that point you brought up. Um, if you want to hear just a great message on the dual nature of grief and praise as two sides of the same coin, listen to, look up uh, Martine Prechtel who's sort of like an indigenous wisdom carrier. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Kelly loves him. Yeah. Uh, that that idea that those both exist simultaneously, and not that they exist simultaneously, but they are like one and the same. Right. When we are grieving someone, what are we grieving? All the things that we loved about them and the fact that they're not there anymore. Mm-hmm. They are the same act. I love the Buddhist uh, concept of the broken glass. 
that the glass is all already broken. Mm. And every time you use the glass, you appreciate it because you know that someday it's going to be broken. Yeah. And then when it's broke, when it does break, you celebrate because you say, I know that I got it. I knew it was going to break the whole time. It's breaking was part of its creation and part of what made the experience with it so precious. There's some study that showed that if you remind people like five times a day that they're going to die, it actually increases their life satisfaction and they tend to like create lives that are more in line with, you know, like the ones they want to be living. Wow. Like it's, uh, I think I've been only doing it four times and that's been kind yeah. of depressing. See, I need to do one more time a day. <laughs> Yeah, there's like a guy, it was, I love the 10% Happier podcast, one of my favorite podcasts, and it, they, they had an interview with the, this guy who made an app that like sends you alerts like a few times a day saying you're going to die, mm. and you would think that that might like get people down, or I think that would be kind of our general societal uh, impression we might have, but not true. Mm. Helps us to uh, to see the shadow side of life, whatever you want to call it. We were talking about dancing earlier, and I was going to ask if you had seen the Kurt Vonnegut meme I posted on our Instagram. Yeah, um, I posted that before you. <laughs> on our Instagram? No, not on our Instagram, so <laughs> I think you took that from me. I love when we just independently find memes that we both love. Read it to us, Tana. I don't have to do the whole thing, but he was basically saying, like, someone was being like, why do you go buy an envelope? You're, like, rich. Just buy, like, order a thousand envelopes and you can have them. You don't have to walk to the store. And he said... I go out to get an envelope because I'm going to have a hell of a good time in the process of buying one envelope. I meet a lot of people and see some great looking babies and a fire engine goes by and I give them a thumbs up and I'll ask a woman what kind of dog that is. And I don't know. The moral of the story is we're here on earth to fart around. And of course the computers will do us out of that. And what the computer people don't realize or they don't care is we're dancing animals. You know, we love to move around and it's like, we're not even supposed to dance at all anymore. It's so true, and this is something I've known for years through through working from home a lot, but I feel like people learned a lot during COVID that like you really can't put a price on those little interactions that you that we previously just did not appreciate. Like the little interactions in the grocery store or just being out in a public place and doing your thing, like those are all so good for us. Mm-hmm. And they really are what make life special. If you just stay inside your own home all the time, generally that's gonna have a really negative impact on your mental health and appreciation for life. And I feel like as people who work from home, like we know, how, especially in the winter, how easy it is to just not make yourself go outside. But then when you do, night and day. Mm-hmm. And yeah, everything can be an adventure. I really, I really like that. Like I love convenience, but I can, I can also see how it has like robbed us of so much. Like I, mm-hmm. I do feel sort of nostalgic for the days when you would, you would know your shopkeeper. I mean, I know my local Seven Eleven guy. So, um, <laughs> Me too. We've had some good banter. Yeah. <laughs> so community banter. wise, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, a few, a few weeks or months ago on the channel, I said that I was making a goal to meet my neighbors and I actually did recently. Yay! I introduced myself and just just being like, I know who my neighbor is. Mm. Totally. Makes you feel safer. Makes you feel safer. Yeah. Seeing pride flags around. I used to be like, Ugh, rainbow capitalism. Like, why are we mass producing, pl- you know, fossil fuel plastic flags? Would be nice if we could come up with a, a better material. But. <laughs> <laughs> but like I walk around and I see those flags and it makes me emotional because I'm like, oh my God, I feel like so safe in my own neighborhood. And, or, you know, having a, a pleasant conversation with a cashier or somebody like totally can turn my day mm-hmm. around. We need to be able to like connect with people and more and more connect in real ways and like learn how Mm -hmm. to, I think if humanity, I think humanity, specifically this country has a lot of growing up to do. Like we have not Mm -hmm. even begun to recognize or reckon with our history, reckon with our own natures. Reckon with how poor city planning is in so many places (laughs) in America. God, the the thing about, I've talked about this before, but like third spaces alone and the absence of them in places like Utah, like a place that isn't your work. Is it like work or church? No, church counts as a third space. It's like not work or home, a third space you'll go. Like Mm -hmm. in England, you're always like walking through like the town square, or I can't explain it, but there's like more like community areas where you'll go. And I suppose there's like the park here, Mm -hmm. but I feel like Utah has like horrible city planning and it's notorious for having no third spaces because the Mormon church like is, is that for people Mm -hmm. not good. And that's why people's whole lives will fall apart when they leave Mormonism because they don't like that would be so lonely because you can't even, even just being able to go to like 
you know, a big area of grass where everyone congregates. There's like not quite a park, but there's just mm-hmm. like them everywhere. Just benches on yeah. the sides of the road, like places to sit and hang yeah. out. But no, you you can't loiter. You can't be anywhere unless you're spending money. Mm. It's the only reason. Even the fact that Mormons shun coffee and tea feels like it's isolating because I feel like tea and coffee culture is so like you stop. Uh, you have a cup of tea or coffee that's like gives you a boost to go on with the day because the caffeine I don't know I feel like that's a big thing in a lot of cultures to like sit and save a tea and coffee mm-hmm. and you know you could in theory have like word of wisdom approved things but they just don't it's just like not a part of the culture you're saying that crumble cookie is not a social gathering place for people well no it doesn't seem like <laughs> no, people doesn't. like go and <laughs> <laughs> meet people and also that wouldn't put a pep in your spot you're in like a sugar coma for the rest of the day I just saw a TikTok yesterday that said more people die of diabetes than have than die of smoking which I think is interesting I, I need to check the numbers on that oh, that's interesting and I wonder how many of those deaths are preventable because if people can't afford insulin Yeek. can't help anyway as we as those of us who are not in doomsday mentality, uh, under, operating under the assumption that the world has to end at any minute and that's just all there is to it. Those of us who are interested in creating a sustainable culture and being serious about the human project moving into the future, we need to find ways to like integrate our actual natures into our life and not just letting all these things happen and boil down and hold in our pain and mm. pretend that we're good so that we can do our 40 hour a week job and blah, 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 and blah, if blah, we blah. can't do it then we have a mental disorder like yeah exactly <laughs> yeah seem to be more real yeah i like this conversation that we had today Me thank too. you for being a part of it and uh i'm i'm looking forward to hearing what you will have to say thank you to all our patrons who support this channel we couldn't do any of this without you uh if you'd like to see what's going on over there we're reading stephanie uh, it's a Mormon 80s teen uh, anti-drug, war on drug book. And she's it's too a good smart time. for drugs. So we, well, we have a great time. We so do. So if you want a good time, a very bingeable series, hop on over to Patreon. You can donate as little as $1 to get all that content. Or as much as $1,000. $1,000, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we really appreciate you being here. I hope you feel some sense of virtual community. If you don't yet have your dream in real life community sometimes it's a process i feel like to oh, for sure to build that up and when you're in it and when you so desperately want it it just feels so like ah like what but you might be surprised if you set the intention to invite community in like what is possible and you know if you kind of have your ear to the ground about things you can go to and, and ways you can connect with people i think one of the top questions we get from people is like how do you find community after mormonism because you have that just like uh, plug and play anywhere in the world you can just show up and there will be mm-hmm. like a bunch of people who are pretty much the same who are like going to be willing to help you move in and hang out with you every sunday mm-hmm. like um hang and out with you yeah and <laughs> leaving that it can feel very very isolating mm-hmm. very depressing and it's like where where do you go making friends what do you do and i think that is uh an act of tending to your own grief and Part of that is like allowing yourself to feel that loss of community, allowing to sit in those feelings, and as a result, being like, well, how do I fill my life with good things? What do I pursue? For me, I grieved the fact that at leaving Mormonism, the only thing that I really missed was singing. Mm. Because I like I didn't really miss hanging out in gospel doctrine class because <laughs> They weren't talking I about things that anyway. I cared about. Like it wasn't a. Pr- they didn't care about talk, saying true things or relevant things or controversial things. All they wanted to do was like do the whitewash narrative thing. So I wasn't having fun there. You could meet any of those spiritual needs elsewhere, but I really miss singing with people. Mm-hmm. So I started with singing people, and I went to a singing camp, and I had this experience. Like that was through my own grieving and tending to my own grief <clears throat> that allowed me to learn more about how to tend to grief, and yeah. um, that's individual for everybody. Yeah, I don't think there's like a but part of growing up doc answer for how to find community. But I will say, as an introvert, I do feel like a big piece of it is deciding what you want, which and you know, like getting kind of clear in your mind about the type of community support and you want to feel. That involves like dialoguing with yourself. I literally sit totally. down on my computer and I say, "What do you want mm-hmm. this week, this day in life?" Powerful and then question. answer. Yeah. Uh, another big question that we explore in coaching sessions because it is surprisingly difficult for people to f- genuinely figure out what they want after leaving Especially those group. who have yeah, been just told what they want their whole life. Anyway. Yeah, but anyway, introvert advice is uh, unfortunately that you you have to be uh, willing to be uncomfortable because I think, I, I just think like social interactions and like 
building relationships, especially in the societies that we're all in, like kind of sometimes discomfort is just part of it. And you have Mm -hmm. to just be okay with that and realize it doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. And it doesn't mean uh, that it's not something worth pursuing. I just think we've all uh, strayed so far from community in so many ways. And or if you know, if you've been Mormon, then you're just used to one specific flavor of it. But I think if you're just willing to like sit in the discomfort uh, and like keep trying, you will find community because we mm. people want to find community. Like that, that's kind of one of the most fundamental things about our species. So, mm. but it'll involve like if you haven't been given the tools and they've just been telling you what to do your whole life, like you won't know how to do that, mm-hmm. and it will inevitably involve growing and stretching and getting out of your comfort zone and exploring and yeah. you know, just trying things you may not like, trying things you do like, and just seeing yeah. what fits and what works. And I think the more you learn about yourself, the more drawn you are to community that's aligned yes. with you. Anyway, this has been great. We're going to go read a chapter of Stephanie for Patreon. I'm so excited. Woo-hoo. Thanks for watching. Tell us about your funeral plans in the comments. Yeah, dream funeral. Drop it below. We got to do this thumbnail.